And without further ado, it's my joy to welcome back Annie. Uh, yeah. And, and, uh, Thank you. Look forward to all your, your content. How much time do we have? Uh, we don't have much time, do we? We've, we've got an hour. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll try and teach you mindfulness quickly, which is a bit of a paradox. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I just want to tell you quickly about the name change, because a lot of you know me as Anne, because it has a honey story, which you will probably like. Um, so my father is a Ngāti Pūrō Māori man from the east coast of New Zealand, and I'm the youngest of five girls, and he named us all after various women, like grandmothers and great-grandmothers in our family. So I have a sister, Tui, and so I got named Annie after my um, great-grandmother, Annie Rangatanoa. Um, but over the years, it just became Anne um, because it was easy and it, that was the closest name that sounded like Ani or Hiniani, which is actually what my real name is. So for 42 years, I mostly just got called Anne. A few people really close to me would call me Hiniani and in New South Wales, I'd got Ani. Um, and we just thought it was the English translation. But my sister came back from New Zealand at Christmas time and said, oh, I met this old Maori dude. He told me that Ani is actually, doesn't mean Anne. I mean, it was really common, you know, Mary got changed to Mary and it just got changed to the closest name that was translatable. So Ani actually means, it's an old Maori name for bush honey. So my name literally, so after years of being, yeah. After years of being a beekeeper, she kind of goes, oh my God, like, you just need to use your real name. Like, no more colonised Anne. Like, just... And so my name, Hiniani, is the prefix you take when you take the name of an elder. It's like a mark of respect. It's like the little one of my ancestors. But it literally means great woman of unconditional love and honey. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of cool. So that's why I've decided to use my real name. And, um, but if you, you know, forget and call me Anne, that's fine. I'm kind of just living with the cultural dysphoria of both of those things. All right. Um, so, mindfulness beekeeping. So we all know there are lots of benefits to beekeeping, obviously. The obvious ones are, what, honey, biodiversity in your garden, beeswax, pollination. pollination. Yeah. I, I kind of want to add mindfulness to that list of benefits and hopefully at the end of this you'll see why. So traditionally people kept bees not for all of those things at all but that was actually a spiritual practice you know a long time ago bees were always kept by the priest and before that the priestesses which is where the whole like Melissa honeybee temple the name Melissa actually comes from the women that kept bees like you, you know, th like a long time ago. And then traditionally, the Jesuit priests particularly kept bees and they made mead and they used the honey, but they kept bees as a spiritual practice. So that was the number one reason why people actually kept hives and the rest was sort of a byproduct of that. So, you know, we, we don't often talk about the spiritual kind of quality of having a relationship with a honeybee family in your backyard. So what does that mean? What does, it, what does mindfulness mean? So it's a word that gets thrown around a lot now in kind of, you know, we often hear it in the media. And so the actual definition of mindfulness is the quality or state of being conscious of something, really present with it. And basically, like, that's a really simple definition. So I'm super lucky that I have Two of my very close friends are actually like two of Melbourne's like mindful, mindful experts. One works at Monash University, the other one's a neuroscientist who actually does all of the research on how mindfulness actually changes your brain. And so they talk about mindfulness in that it's just the ability to actually be present and concentrate on something without your mind wandering off. So we experience this in two places. Usually we've all had an experience of this, of being really present with something. One is when you're doing something you really love, something that is your, your, your most favourite thing to do, and you kind of get into that flow state where you're just thinking about that and all of a sudden two or three hours has passed and you don't even notice that that time has gone and, and you've not been distracted, you've just been concentrating 
on that thing. So even if it's reading a book, might be, or something, a hobby, knitting, or tinkering around with your car, or whatever it is that the thing that you often really love doing, you can be incredibly present with that thing and not even realise that time is passing. So that's mindfulness. The second time, apparently, we experience mindfulness is when we're in an acute state of danger. So if you're swimming around at the beach and all of a sudden there is a shark two metres away from you, are you thinking about anything else? What are you thinking about? You instantly become incredibly present with that situation, don't you? Very, very present, very present with that shark and what you're going to do. You're not thinking about anything else. Your mind doesn't go anywhere. You're just like really focused on that. Yeah, and so our brain actually changes. Um, like it's actually using different parts of our brain that make us become incredibly present and focused. On Let's talk about what unmindful beekeeping might look like. <laughs> I, <laughs> okay, so I have an unmindful beekeeping experience where um, I was, it was the end of a day, a hot day. I'm, I'd had some hives left at my house in possum boxes. It was a rescue job. So it was someone, you know, we'd rescued possum boxes and we'd you might have, some of you might have heard this story. And we've, we just sort of dumped them in my apiary in the backyard. And, you know, I kept saying to my partner at the time, I've got to move the possum box, I've got to do something with the possum box. And it was spring, the weather's warming up. Um, and I, it was a long day, I'd come home, I just sat down on my veranda, it was hot. And all of a sudden, I see this cloud of bees swarming out of the possum box. And of course, going to the highest, most awkward tree in my backyard and hanging there and kind of going, oh, like six o'clock, the kids are hungry, I've got to do dinner, I don't have time to deal with this. So I'm flustered, I don't want to do it, I'm cross because the situation should have been resolved about that box before, you know, it's crowded, of course it's going to swarm, I needed to have got to it earlier. So I put my suit on, I put half a suit on because I'm hot, I just put my half suit on and I get my neighbour and we rig up poles and you know all the stuff that you do and, and I was rushing, I was cranky and I have never been so stung, I got stung about 25 times <laughs> and, and we actually had to like run down the street like several houses before they stopped chasing us, this swarm. Eventually I got it into the box, but it was not a positive experience, and obviously, and um, they were in my suit, and so I, you know, I kind of thought if I had been in a different mood before I even began that, it would have been a different outcome, right? I would have gone more carefully, I would have had a different energy about me, so... We've probably all had experiences like this, have we? So, <laughs> where you're rushing or you've got to do something, you're cranky and it's the only warm day you've had for a month and you've got to get in there and, and, we, and something goes wrong. Yeah, I will talk about that because there is a bit of an urban myth that bees smell fear and it's a little bit inaccurate but it's also... Oh, we'll talk about it in a sec. So, unmindful beekeeping. Rushing, I, for me, is always like the, the, <laughs> the biggest mistake I can make. You end up squishing bees. You, you always end up killing a lot more. So, the bees are, are then sending out their attack pheromone <laughs> more. The more bees that die, the more that that hive is on alert and the guards are, you know, going to be more activated. Um, you end up banging and dropping things which they don't like. You end up not actually observing your hive and listening to it. If you're rushing, you miss things. You don't pick up on the fact that, um, oh, um, there might be something weird going on with that bit of brood there or you've got a hive, hive beetle situation or, or, you know, you'll miss information. Um, and then you get into a state of panic often because <laughs> it's accelerating, the situation is accelerating and there's like high pitch buzzing and there's bees starting to get more and more, you know, coming at you. 
not having the equipment you need. That's like, so, so often I go down to, the, I'm just going to do a quick job. I'm just going to stick the feeder in. And I get down there and I go, oh, something else is going on. I've got to do this and I don't have what I need. And my smoker keeps going out because I didn't get enough pine needles. Um, I'm sounding like a really bad beekeeper. <laughs> Um, you see, then you get more, you know, you get oh. <laughs> increased um, agitation. It becomes high stress, thank you. It becomes high stress for you and the bee. The bees are becoming more highly stressed and then you're becoming more highly stressed. And then you're more at risk of increased stings. So you all get that picture? Yeah. So what would the opposite of that look like? Yeah, definitely. Slowing down. Yeah. Um, having, making sure you have what you need. And sometimes that means actually taking things you don't think you're necessarily going to need, but just in case, so that's on hand. Um, like an example of that might be. Extra frames. Yeah, often extra frames. Yeah. Sometimes even a spare hive tool. Sometimes I drop my hive tool in the long grass by accident and then I'm fishing around looking for it. And a spare hive tool sometimes is like just pull that one out, can keep going. And when you've closed up your hive, you can find it, you know, that kind of thing. So, so that, you know, you can attend to what you need to do without being flustered. Um, slowing down, becoming aware of your senses. So th this is one of the mindful practices is just being really aware of what you can hear, what you can smell, what, what you can see. And those three things actually make you an exceptional beekeeper because some of the best beekeepers I know can open a hive and will tell you before they've pulled one frame out, you've got a problem. I can smell something or I can see or hear something. I'm picking up that there's a problem with the queen or there's some disease or that these bees aren't behaving there's something there's like a, a sense that something's not quite right in that hive and especially if it's a hive that you know really well you, when you open the lid you feel like something's not quite right they're not making the same sound that they normally do so being aware of smell and sound I mean you can actually smell AFB when it gets quite bad and the smell of your hive changes over the year right Sometimes it's really lemony and sometimes it's really sweet, depending on if there's honey in the hive or not. So that kind of, that smell is, can be a really good indicator also of what's going on. So, so you're not just looking with your eyes, you're using all of your senses to pick up as much information as you can. Um, having a relaxed body is really important and being aware of your breath. So one of the things that's interesting about bees not smelling fear, like technically, I mean, yeah, bees obviously communicate with smell and pheromones, but um, studies have shown that what they're actually picking up on is carbon dioxide. Um, and a lot of insects and animals do this. Um, they'll sense what's around by being able to actually smell the level of carbon dioxide. If you're feeling stressed or rushed or anxious or panicked, what is the first thing that you start doing in your body? You start breathing differently, start exhaling actually more carbon dioxide than you normally would. So it's the same way that dogs pick up when you're frightened, that's actually what it is, you know, when an animal or horses are like this as well, incredibly sensitive, and where we have this kind of myth as they can sense fear, what they're actually picking up on is that you've started to exhale more carbon dioxide than you normally would. Uh, so, being aware of your breathing, and if you are in a panicked state where something has gone wrong or something's a little, the bees are more agitated than you were expecting, which they sometimes can be in the spring, sometimes they get just a bit antsy in the spring, um, more than they normally are at other times, you know, just being aware of like slowing down your breath and being aware of your breathing is an awesome mindfulness practice. When you use a smoker, do you pump things popping out like into the <coughs> light on the react again? Well, they do. What the smoker is doing is that it 
blocks the attack pheromone from the queen so that there's so much of the smoke going on that the bees stop communicating. That's actually what your smoke is doing, right? It's stopping the communication of we're under attack so that there's, the bees are not picking up on that signal. Somebody else has, there's also a theory out there that the smoker makes them think it's a bushfire and they'll go and eat honey and start picking out on honey and then they kind of get a bit honey drunk. I don't know if there's any studies that actually confirm that or if that's just a bit of an urban myth. But the purpose of the smoker is that it blocks the pheromone. Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of smell that's in the smoke as well. Um, and just, yeah, moving carefully, moving with care. Um, movement actually triggers bees more than smells. And we know that they're really sensitive to smell, like if you've got petrol or strong perfume, yeah? Um, strong smelling sort of things around, they definitely can agitate bees. Uh, but there was a study done where people moved through a, an apiary with strong smells and the bees were not really phased, but moving through with a lot of movement and they were on alert. That was one of the things that put them onto alert. So moving with care, which is a mindfulness practice as well. Uh, the other interesting thing about breathing is before you get your smoker going, really, once you open the hive, take a big deep breath because there is a hospital in Czechoslovakia, a lung clinic, which you might have seen on the internet, which actually has set up beehives with um, like snorkels and breathing apparatus. And the treatment is to come and sit and breathe in the air from a hive for an hour because it's antibacterial, antiviral, right? So that air that is in your hive when you first take the lid off is really, really good for you. <laughs> So the first thing you can do when you take the lid off before it's got all smoky is like just take a nice deep breath in. Like awesome, thank the bees for that like full breath of cl really cleansing air. It's apparently good for you. And that also reminds you to be aware of your breathing. Is that true? <laughs> no, it's not me. I kind of wish it was. <laughs> so how would you beekeep differently if you didn't have a suit? Would you approach your hive the same way? So well, <laughs> it's like honeybee porn. <laughs> yeah, if you had no suit on, but there are a lot of people that free hive. <laughs> yeah. Free hive, especially in Europe. A lot of people don't wear suits in Europe. A lot of older bee beekeepers don't wear a lot of suiting. So how, how would you beekeep differently? So I think, you know, it, yeah, you would move much more mindfully, wouldn't you? And carefully and slowly without sudden movements. And you would be much more in tune with how the bees are revving up. You know, if you hear them kind of, you know, you'd slow down back off, wait, go back. Yeah, I mean, you can hear, you can often find the queen. I used to find the queen because as you're pulling frames out, when you pull the frame that the queen's on out, the sound the bees make changes, right? If you're really in your senses and listening to your hive, and, and you can, I can go pull the frame out and once you've got the frame that the queen's on, when you pull her out of the hive, the hive goes, Vroom. it makes the sound. It knows that the queen has just been yanked out of the hive, right? And then you can go, she's on this frame. So that kind of extra sensory level, <laughs> it's really useful. So these are my four mindful beekeeping tips. Slow down, become aware of your senses, calm breath and be aware of your breath and um, relaxed in your body. And they are the four principles of mindfulness just by coincidence, isn't that interesting? So these are the stats that we know about mindfulness. 10 minutes of mindfulness practice a day. Statistically, there's studies and that you have decreased stress, higher brain functioning, increased immune function, lowered blood pressure, lowered heart rate, increased awareness, attention, focus, clarity in thinking and perception, lower anxiety, um, 
benefits of feeling just connected and happier in general. Um, enhanced ability to deal with illness, faster recovery time. My friend Neil, who is the neuroscientist, has, is one of the first people that's done a study of measuring this stuff with people that have long-term mindfulness practice who have practiced some sort of mindful meditation for, more, for 10 minutes a day over for more than five years. And he's found a lot of this. He can actually scientifically prove it, that they will recover from illness more quickly. Um, much less depression, improved general health, cardiovascular systems, healthier body mass index. Uh, greater resilience when faced with challenges, uh, decreased stress and psychological distress, enhanced mental health functioning, emotional regulation and self-control, enhanced academic achievement in students due to improved ability to focus and improved attention, higher social and relational skills, different, uh, reduced aggression and problem behaviours, enhanced job performance. So we know that it's good for you. <laughs> Statistically, beekeepers live longer than most other professions. They have lower rates of cancer, higher, a lower blood pressure report, higher rates of happiness than any other industry. Isn't that interesting? So they are all the benefits to us in practicing mindfulness. And so, there's like mutual benef benefits. Um, just keeping bees and the things that you automatically do in order to keep your bees is sort of automatically mindfulness practice, whether you are aware of it or not, or whether you've ever thought about it in these terms or not. You're actually doing those things. You are being very present. We're usually pretty present when we open the hive, aren't we? You have to be, or you're going to get stung, you know? <laughs> We're usually moving more calmly and more quietly. Um, I started keeping bees because my son had autism and he got interested in bees and he had a lot of agitation and couldn't sit still for very long. And after beekeeping, he learned from beekeeping that he had to be able to self-calm. Right? In order to go and hang out with the bees, he had to find this ability to calm himself down and self-calm. And once he could do that, through practicing doing that at the hive, um, you know, then he was able to do it in other situations. And when he was having a bad day, and he had hives at school as well, he was lucky with Tobias. And when he was having a bad day, we used to say, you know, go and hang out with the bees. And we would send him down to the hive because he would have to, when he got there, self-calm. And there's actually studies um, in England where they're using beekeeping with children with behavioural problems and HD. HDHD, particularly for that ability that you have to learn to self-calm when you're around bees. You can't have massive tantrums and be flapping around and yelling and screaming around a beehive, right? So it's an instant kind of drop into mindfulness. So be... <laughs> or get stung. Or get stung. Like it's instant consequence, right? <laughs> So we're, bees are give, sort of giving all this to us, you know, whether we're aware of it or not, we're kind of learning to do this through just this kind of fun hobby that we have of keeping bees. So what do the bees benefit? Um, we all know the bees are really sensitive. You know, they pick up on climatic change. You can f tell what's going to happen um, in the coming season by what your hive's doing in kind of August, September. You know, you, we, could, we could say, I used to be able to say, tell you what kind of summer it was going to be by what the bees, was, how they were setting up their hive. Um, they pick up on your heart rate. They pick up on adrenaline in your system. When you get stung, bee venom is actually designed to give you a massive adrenaline response. Partly that's so you'll run away and leave the bees alone, the bear or whatever it is that's trying to get into the hive. But partly it is also because the bees, the bees just p then pick up on the pheromones. So if you notice you get stung in one place, all the other bees come to that same place. You notice that? And they're trying to get, because that's because you've had a um, a, an adrenaline response and they can pick up on that. So they can follow you <laughs> and like chase you off. <laughs> um, they also 
do have an acute sense of smell. We don't actually really understand that. There aren't, that we haven't really done studies that understand the B sense of smell and that whole relationship with pheromones and communication. We know it exists, but not, there's not a lot written about it. It's really interesting if anyone wants to go and do research in that area. Uh, they're sensitive to carbon dioxide and they also have a very sensitive um, electronic field. Part of that is part of that navigation system. Um, they say that bees' vision is actual six dimension. Um, and, 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 and so there's this kind of electronic field that they have. And so that's why you don't take your mobile phone with you while you're um, opening your hive. Because they'll, they'll often pick up on the, elect if your phone's ringing, it will agitate them. It's the, electromagnetic f the electronic f magnetic field that interrupts them. So we also have electronic magnetic fields as well, and so the bees pick up on that if we're agitated or stressed or feeling cranky, the bees are picking up on that too. They also have a memory, really good memory. So one of the stories that I tell is a friend of mine who um, was busy and didn't attend to her hive particularly well over the season and then realized that it was very badly cross-combed. And I went there one day and we got into it and tried to sort it out. And in the process, she kind of panicked and became very stressed. And she ended up kind of just digging handfuls of honey out. It was one of those kind of disaster stories and there were bees everywhere and being stung. And the bees were very upset of course, and they and it was a really beautifully well-behaved hive. She could mow right up around her hive. They never bothered her. No one had ever been stung by it. They were super, that crazy hive. After that negative experience, for her as well, she was kind of like, I'm going to give up beekeeping. She was so mortified at how many bees she'd squashed and killed and just so stressed about that experience that she wanted to give up beekeeping, which is a shame. And secondly, though, the bees remembered the trauma and they every time she went in the backyard for four months they would chase and sting her which was a, a hive that would never have stung her previous they remembered yeah they do, they do. Bees have facial recognition. There's a lot of studies, that's right. And you'll see them do it. Like if you notice, sometimes you'll get one and they come and do that like little weird zigzag, yeah? They're checking you out. Yeah, they get to know you. They, your bees would actually get to know you. They recognise your face. And isn't that the mysterious thing? But, and, but yet they pass on information because you have to remember that this is a super organism individual bees die but there is a collectiveness how do drones know drones die this time every year all right there's no drones in the hive spring comes how do the drones know to go to the drone to the queen um what's it called the, the hang yeah how do they know they weren't there last summer there was no other drones to pass that information on this crazy magical stuff about bees that we don't know we don't understand why they do this stuff but they pass information on there's a collective consciousness that happens in your hive why do they have the same personality when individual bees are dying all the time those same bee those bees are in your hive now weren't bees that were there six weeks ago but your hive has the same quality to it doesn't it, it has the same personality or this it's doing yeah I can't explain that. No one <laughs> has come up with an explanation for that. It's just, you know, one of nature's mysteries, really. Maybe it's the queen doing Yeah, well, that's right. Uh, how do they remember to come home again? How do they remember all the stuff that they do? Yeah, you know, they pass, they're obviously passing information on somehow. Yeah, there's a, there's a beautiful old story in beekeeping about a beekeeper of 60 years who died and the bees at his funeral swarmed and covered his coffin. Now, I don't know if it's true or not. You can Google it and there's actual newspaper articles about it happening and photos of it. But they actually apparently swarmed and covered his coffin in bees at his funeral. <laughs> Yeah. 
yeah. Maybe they, you know, he was just so like, smelled like honey after years of being a beekeeper. Who knows? All right, so all these things, of the bees, you know, are beneficial to us. Like, you know, that is so classic honeybee, isn't it? They're such incredibly benef benef great benefactors. They do, you know, they're one of the few animals that don't take anything from the system. Most other things will take something. So cows will eat grass, but they're actually taking, killing the grass in the process, right? I think bees are one of the very few insects that when they're eating and they're taking food, they're actually benefiting another species by pollinating. So, and they make extra honey, don't they? They make way, usually, they make way more honey than, than they need. Um, so they're, they're like incredibly generous creatures in their ability to benefit us. So one of the things, you know, I, th I think to inspire beekeepers to just kind of be aware of that level of health benefit that you're actually getting. If you never eat the honey out of your hive um, and they're not pollinating your garden necessarily, but just having them there and having a relationship with them actually is really good for your health. So what are the bees getting out of it? If we are able to beekeep more mindfully, yeah. You know, what else? Um, they're, they're, they're going to be obviously a happier hive if you're not squishing them and stressing them out. We know that immune drops in bees when they're stressed. We, we know that from pollination, wrapping them on, in glad wrap and putting them on the backs of trucks stresses bees and they're much more likely to be susceptible to diseases the same way that we are and probably the same as most species. Immunity drops when we're stressed. So you're more likely to have a healthier hive. You're more likely to have a better behaved hive in the long run because the bees will get used to you being gentle with them. And they're not going to remember, oh, like this, this is what happened last time. Like it's got to start stinging early because we know what happened last time we all got squished. Because they remember. Um, Traumatised your bees. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I think you know, just over time. Just over time. They've been handled differently. They can bees. Yeah. Bees. I. You can tell a hive that's been handled roughly. I used to visit hundreds of hives out here in the valley, and they're called a hot hive. You can tell when they've been handled roughly because of the way they behave. Um, you're more likely to pick up on diseases early and quickly, aren't you? If you're going slowly and you're listening and smelling and kind of your senses are on and you are really aware of that, you're much more likely to pick up really early that something's odd or pick up on disease. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I know people that used to sing to their hive. Yeah, there's a long practice of singing to your bees when you, because the sound and the rhythm, it somehow lulled them. <laughs> this, the history of this stuff is really kooky and interesting. What else? Anything else about the benefits? For the bees? No, they don't. I mean, the only way they know anything is about how you treat them, really, isn't it? How, with what gentleness or care that you're actually doing your inspections with. Is that why when you get a feral hive, you're not happy? Yeah. Often, you know, if you have a hive... It's not getting squished. Yeah. Often they're not used to being handled. So they say, you know, a hive, like a hot hive, one that hasn't been open, if you find a, a derelict or an abandoned hive, you know, they usually will, will often can be really feral just because they're not used to being mm. around humans. Yeah. Well, that's right. Like, I don't have st sort of studies for this. Like, there is no one that's done research on this. But exactly, that's why I thought I'd, like, we, we could collectively kind of come up 
with a theory, I guess, about how keeping mind, keep, you know, mindfully keeping bees is actually beneficial to the bees. Yeah, exactly. If they're not stressed, they're not necessarily going to eat as much honey. I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. Definitely you're going to have higher disease resistance. Yeah. Um, most small creatures, certainly any other insects, probably only, mainly only birds, don't control their temperature. So the rates of their consuming energy vary before you get down to temperature. Uh, some creatures like bees find other ways to keep their temperature control mm. by creating a hive and containing that one. That's why they eat more honey in the cold. That's right. I, I haven't heard anybody in the time that I've been here ever talk about more or less insulation around the hive, mm. nor that there should be more or less insulation in this place or in that place, with the exception of a Korean friend who told me they keep, used to keep the beehive inside, in the house. Mm. So the beehive would be in the kitchen, um, close to where the heating apparatus was, and that was connected. Go in and out. Yeah. And that's why in Germany they have bee houses, the same reason. Like keeps the snow off and, and the collective warmth of all the bees packed in close, you know, keep um, the yelling there's a honey a honey keeper that's out at Yellingbo State Forest. Um, and he keeps bees in, I forget what they're called. They're like the polystyrene plastic boxes. Yeah, the Lyson boxes. Thank you. Now, he says that his bees eat less honey and they lay brood all the way to the edges because they're warm. Yeah. And, I mean, I learnt beekeeping kind of originally from Adrian in Iodice. Probably some of you have done his courses with the top bar. You know, and he told me that, um, you know, opening your hive is like open heart surgery. And that bee warmth, which the bees have so worked hard to keep in there, you know, you're just ripping open the lid and all that warmth is coming out. And that's the principle of natural beekeeping and top bar beekeeping is to be able to contain, be able to do an inspection in a way that you can contain that warmth because in a laying, you've got to rip the top off where and hot air rises, right? So the top of the hive, it just comes rushing out and then you move, you run packing the boxes and you're pulling the whole thing apart where in a different kinds of hives, in a top bar, for example, you can, because the roof actually, because the top of the bar is sealing the hive, you can just move and, uh, as you go along. You've got, how many people here have top bar hives? Yeah, so you can keep, keep the, you can contain how much warmth you're losing as you go. So definitely temperature is a really important thing to be aware of when you're mindfully keeping bees, to not, let too much of that, especially at this time of year. It takes them a whole day, again, to build up that temperature of warmth. You know, it's 36 degrees in, the, in that brood chamber. If it's 12 degrees outside, that's a lot, you know, they've got to raise that another 20 degrees more then. And it takes a lot of energy and then they're going to be eating more honey. So, yeah, the lies and boxes, apparently, really well insulated and they... They're seeing that temperature control differently. Round hives as well control temperature better because it, the, the hot air is like a helix process in there. And, and you know, like Sabias used to say, but how honeys, bees are round animals. <laughs> they don't like square boxes. They live in trees. They're, they're used to round spaces. They can they don't get cold corners. They can actually contain temperature better when they're in a round cylindrical yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. They're still a lang. 
but they're just so they're you know well insulated and I don't think the thickness of our boxes is enough for this for what for the valley the valley is cold you know um we get these little they're so thin like the top bars are nice in that they're thick the wood is insulating itself you know if you can have a thickness a nice chunky thickness of wood you know the top bar also has the roof cavity which is like a layer of insulation it can warm up just that you know the hives here but they have this air space above the hive and under the roof so that's why people using that um uh, sometimes a pitched roof to get that air cavity in there above the yeah okay great so um i'm actually going to do a little meditation with you with bees buzzing like <laughs> so the, the purpose of this is um, that some people actually find this relaxing. I don't. I find it distressing myself, um, the sound of bees. It's, it's an alarm signal usually. I mean, sometimes you get, actually, that's not true. Sometimes you get that hive just singing, you know, on a nice day and you can just hear the bees. Often when you're doing an inspection, it's a higher pitched buzz and it's more of an alarm kind of signal. And it's designed to warn and agitate you. So some people find listening to this actually alarming, like it, it's agitating. Um, so you might find it really relaxing and it might just lull you into a mindful state of peaceful bliss. <laughs> <laughs> or you might find that you feel, you know, your breath changes. So first of all, I want you, we're going to listen to this and then I want you to be aware of like what's happening in your body when you're listening to it, you know. So we're going to just sit quietly and just sort of be present with the sound of the bees and see whether you feel uncomfortable, see whether it, what effect it actually has on your body. If you're a person that this makes your heart rate rise slightly, it's actually a really good practice to practice calming to this sound so that what you're doing is laying down neural pathways so that when you're in a situation a highly agitated bee buzzing situation you have a greater capacity to actually be able to self calm for example when there is a bee in your suit <laughs> okay what happens when there's a bee inside your suit or multiple bees inside your suit if you have a little panic what's going to happen so you know you've got to stay really calm haven't you you've got to just Slow your breathing down, stay calm, pack your hive up, walk quietly over here, very calmly take off your suit and shake the bee out. So the more you practice doing this, the easier it will be to actually be able to stay calm with slow breath in those situations. Okay, so let's find a comfortable spot. If I was teaching you mindfulness, feet on the ground, you don't have to, who's, who, is there anyone here that's never meditated before? Never meditated? Oh, Frank, no way. <laughs> because it's good for your health. <laughs> You'll live longer for it. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to play this recording. Close your eyes if you want to. Just stay focused on your breathing. If your mind wanders off, just notice it's wandered off. Bring it back. No judgment around that. Like, you don't have to be you know void space or anything just listen to the just listen to the bees um, and just allow yourself to kind of stay calm and notice if you're feeling not calm what's happening come back to your breath just come back to being aware of your breath <laughs>
So that was about six minutes of your 10 minutes mindfulness for the day. You've got another four minutes to do. <laughs> All right. What?